Welcome to Psych 230, Social Psychology. Today, I'm gonna to be going over the first chapter, our introduction, and we're gonna be going over these things over here. We're gonna define social psychology, talk about what it is. We're gonna go over the major theories, the so-called grand theories that come up again and again in social psychology. And I'm going to go over some research methods. First, the descriptive methods like the survey and observation, things like that. Um, and then that's probably as far as I'll get for this lecture, experimental methods, validity, that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll have to wait for the second lecture on this chapter uh, to go over those things. So why don't I get, I get started? Okay, what is social psychology? So social psychology, as it says here, is the scientific study of how people's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are influenced by other people. Uh, that's a good definition. Um, there's another possible definition what, that would be the scientific study of how people's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are influenced by social situations. And social situations usually imply uh, other people. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, about people. You can be in a situation like uh, a room, for instance, that is very hot, and that can affect your behavior. That's also social psychology. But usually we're talking about social situations, how that influences people's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And if you think about thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, that's what psychology is about. But social psychology just looks at that from a uh, perspective that involves other people, usually, a social situation. Let's keep going. Social psychology, like uh, any other science, um, involves can involve two things. One is description, another one is explanation. Uh, description, what we're talking about there is uh, careful and reliable observations. Um, when you describe things, you're merely you know, reporting what you found. You may observe, for instance, and then you report what you found. That's an example of description. Explanation is another possibility, uh, and that's a bit harder to do. Uh, with explanation, you try to develop theories that try to connect and organize observations, and you try to explain what's actually going on, okay? You're trying to make sense of the evidence. And when you explain things, often you're also trying to get at cause and effect. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about experiments. More about this. Now, speaking of theories, um, speaking, I should say, of uh, explanations, um, Theories are, uh, are things that actually help us uh, uh, explain things. Theories are scientific explanations that do two things. They connect and organize existing observations. So in other words, theories help us basically uh, make sense of the data, organize it in some way, make sense of it, um, and also allow us uh, fruitful paths for future research, it says. So theories also allow us to make new predictions, come up with new hypotheses, to think of other things that we might want to test in order to test the theory or maybe in order to uh, test something that may be related. Let's keep going. Now, speaking of theories, here are the four uh, major theories that come up again and again within social psychology. We have the social cultural theory, the evolutionary theory, the social learning theory, and the social cognitive theory. So these are the perspectives or theories and then we're gonna talk about how each um, can drive social behavior, how each tries to explain um, social behavior, okay? So first let's talk about the social cultural theory or the social cultural perspective. The social cultural theory says that forces in larger social groups, such as norms, fads, social class, and ethnic identity are things that basically uh, drive social behavior. Um, so, for example, uh, norms are kind of things that people do again and again, and they usually uh, can be thought of as unwritten rules about how people should behave in certain situations. Like it's a, it's a norm, for instance, that uh, when you're in an elevator with, uh, you know, uh, another group of people, let's say there's two other people in there, the norm is that you do not speak, okay? You just stand there, face the front, and you don't say anything. That's a norm. And when people violate that norm and they start speaking, um, sometimes uh, that is seen as, as a little bit weird. Like you're not supposed to talk when you're in an elevator with other people. 
especially if there are strangers and you know they don't know each other. Now, if you know each other, that would be different. That would be a different norm, okay? But norms are things that people do again and again, and, and after a while, it's just expected that you're, that you're gonna behave that way. Fads are things like trends, you know, fashion, things that sort of uh, come and go while they're popular, people follow them, okay? And when they're no longer popular, then people don't follow them anymore. Social class, class ethnic identity, things that have to do with basically people's identity are very strong drivers of social behavior. Your social class affects your behavior a great deal. You know, not just, for instance, uh, you know, the kind of car you're going to drive or where you're going to live, uh, but also what you consider appropriate um, as far as, let's say, the way you speak, okay, or uh, manners or things like that. Social class is uh, very important in determining what people considered acceptable forms of behavior. If you're upper class, uh, behavior is usually judged differently than if you're lower class, right? The, you know, the, the norms there, what's acceptable is different. Ethnic identity also can uh, be an important driver of uh, social behavior. For some ethnic groups, it's uh, more acceptable, for instance, to um, you know, display your anger, to show that you are upset. For other ethnic groups, not so much. So that's what social, care, social cultural theory says, that all these things, norms, fads, social class, ethnic identity, and other related things are really what are driving our social behavior. Now, evolutionary theory says something different. That's a different perspective. The evolutionary perspective says that genetic predispositions um, that promote our ancestor's survival and reproduction, such as the bond between a parent and child, are actually what drive social behavior. So it says that we have genetic tendencies and that uh, these tendencies are basically, uh, the reason we have them is because they've been passed down um, because they were useful in the past for survival and for reproduction. I'll give you an example, aggressive behavior, for instance. Um, while we don't see it as very useful in today's society, in the past, it was very important for our ancestors' survival. Those individuals that were aggressive were the ones that were more likely to survive and basically uh, you know, be able to protect themselves from predators that may be trying to eat them or, uh, or even uh, other challenges uh, for those, for instance, who might want to drive them away and take away their mates, so to speak. You know, those that were not aggressive, they didn't get to survive and they didn't get to reproduce because if they were not aggressive, another competitor, an aggressive one, would basically drive them away and would take away their mate. And that way you can say that aggressive behavior was useful for our ancestors in the past. We don't live in that kind of society anymore. And aggressive, aggressive behavior is now more harmful than good, but it was useful in the past. And that's why we, have, we still have that genetic predisposition to behave aggressively sometimes, especially among males. Now there's lower levels of aggression among females, among women, because it's not as useful for women to be aggressive. Okay, which is, you know, I'll, I'll get into those sorts of explanations later when we talk about aggressive behavior when we get to that chapter. But I've given you at least one example of the evolutionary perspective and, you know, what it says about, uh, you know, what drives social behavior. Let's talk about social, the social learning perspective now. The social learning perspective says basically that learning is what drives social behavior. It says that classically conditioned responses, habits, rewarded and even punished by others on an imitation of behavior that may be rewarded, right? We see behavior, we observe behavior being rewarded, that those sort of things are what drive social behavior. And if you think about what you learned in Psych 101, classical conditioning, right, is a form of learning. That's learning due to association. So for instance, uh, a lot of people, for instance, are afraid of policemen because policemen are associated with punishment. For those same reasons, a lot of people don't like policemen, okay? I understand that some people may feel more comfortable around policemen than others, but for certain people, police are mostly associated with punishment and therefore they don't like them, they fear police, okay? That's classical conditioning, okay? Learning through association. Habits rewarded by others or maybe habits punished by others, uh, that's operant conditioning. That's another form of learning that simply says that, you know, behaviors that are rewarded tend to persist and behaviors that are punished 
uh, tend to uh, go away. It's not that simple, but it's basically learning through rewards and punishments, okay? Imitation of behavior is social learning. That's the third form of learning that is covered uh, in the learning chapter of um, an introductory psychology class. Yes, when we observe somebody else performing a behavior, and especially if they get rewarded, we're likely to imitate that behavior. So the social learning perspective basically says that learning, these three forms of learning are, are actually what drive social behavior. And last, we have the social cognitive perspective. Whenever you see the word cognitive, it means it has something to do with thinking. So social cognitive perspective says that what drives social behavior is what we pay attention to, how we interpret and judge social situations and what we retrieve from memory. If you don't pay attention to certain things, they really cannot affect your behavior, okay? And um, your interpretation of certain events, okay? So let's say like uh, somebody's behavior, right? The way you interpret that person's behavior uh, will lead to you judging the behavior in a certain way and, and will then you know, lead to your behavior toward them. If you interpret the behavior uh, as rude, if you see the behavior in a certain way, right, that maybe they're doing certain things that are not good, and then you judge the behavior as being rude, for instance, then you're going to treat them badly. If you interpret their behavior maybe as accidental, maybe some, well, maybe some things are going on that are not so positive, right, but uh, you judge the behavior more as being accidental, right, then you're not as likely to, uh, you know, treat them badly. What we retrieve from memory will also affect uh, our behavior according to the social cognitive perspective or social cognitive theory. It, if we don't remember certain things, um, then we are not as likely to notice them, okay? And then we're not as likely to judge them in certain ways. If we don't remember something, we can't really act on it, okay? So that's what the social cognitive perspective says, okay? It basically says that our thinking is really what drives our social behavior. And just to review, basically the social cultural perspective says that basically it's norms, fads, social class, ethnic identity, those kind of cultural things are what drive our behavior. The evolutionary perspective says it's more genetic predispositions that promote survival and reproduction. The social learning perspective says that it's basically learning, class conditioning, operant conditioning, and social learning that drive behavior. And the social cognitive perspective says it's our thinking that drives behavior. Let's keep going. Let's talk about how social psychologists um, um, study behavior or how psychologists study social behavior. So we're gonna talk about this thing called the hypothesis. We already mentioned the theory and what a theory is. A theory is an explanation of something that tries to organize the data, make sense of the data and allows us to make new predictions. Well, a hypothesis is a prediction, okay? It's a researcher's prediction about he or, what he or she will find. Hypotheses are often derived from theories. Let's keep going. And if we have a hypothesis, a prediction, how might we test the hypothesis? We can use descriptive methods or we can use experimental methods. Descriptive methods, uh, we're talking about attempts to measure and record behaviors, such as thoughts and feelings in their natural state. So when you use a descriptive method, we're really talking about doing something like maybe uh, a survey doing an observation, something like that, where all you really do is maybe you record behavior or you observe and record behavior. You do something like that. You measure, right? But you're just basically, in the end, just going to describe what you found. Experimental methods, on the other hand, are a bit more involved. And experimental methods actually uh, involve attempts to manipulate, it says, social processes by varying some aspect of the situation. When you use an experimental method, you, that involves some manipulation where you try to do something to people, maybe intoxicate them, maybe make them feel a certain way to see what happens to their behavior. That is a manipulation. So experimental methods, we're talking about the experiment there, which is the only method that really gets at cause and effect. Let's keep going. Now let's talk about descriptive methods first. We're gonna go over several of them. So social psychologists usually use five major types of descriptive methods. And one of them is a naturalistic observation. Another one's a case study. There's also archives, surveys, and psychological tests. We're gonna go over these 
uh, these five descriptive methods. So let's get started and talk about the first one, a naturalistic observation. Now this part, the stuff that we're talking about here, these are things that you probably uh, you know, heard from a Psych 101 class, an introductory psychology class. So this should be review for a lot of you, okay? Naturalistic observation, that's uh, first. What is a naturalistic observation? It's basically uh, an observation of behavior as it unfolds in its natural setting. You don't have to use the word naturalistic. It can also just be called an observation. Um, and you wanna do an observation and, uh, you know, in a setting where the behavior occurs naturally, where you don't have to make it happen. If you're observing animals, that might mean out in the wild somewhere, man, the mountains and the jungles, that kind of stuff. But if you're observing human behavior, a naturalistic observation or just an observation can be many different places depending on the behavior. If you wanna observe children playing because you wanted to determine if they, let's say play in same sex groups versus mixed sex groups, then uh, you can observe at a playground or even at a school if you should get permission. That's a naturalistic observation. If you wanna observe, for instance, uh, you know, people uh, shopping, let's say, you wanna observe that kind of behavior, then you can go to a mall. Or a lot of shopping nowadays is done online. You can observe people using their phones, shopping for things, let's say. So wherever the behavior occurs naturally, you can, uh, you know, you can do a naturalistic observation. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to these methods. So we're gonna, so I'm gonna talk now about the advantages of a naturalistic observation, okay? One advantage of doing a naturalistic observation is the behaviors that are being observed are spontaneous. You don't have to make it happen. It's happening without you doing anything. So it's real behavior in the real world, okay? And that's a very good thing. That's actually what you want because ultimately when you do a study, what you wanna say when you actually write up your study, you wanna be able to conclude that what you found from this study explains what's happening out there. And if your study begins by, by basically observing behavior out there, then that means you're looking at real behavior, spontaneous behavior. It's a very good thing, it's very valid, okay? Another advantage of doing a naturalistic observation is that it doesn't rely on people's ability to report their own experiences. People don't have to tell you what they're doing, um, or what's happening. You observe them and you record what you see. And that's important um, that people don't have to tell you because sometimes you observe you know, individuals who cannot tell you. Children are often unable to tell you what it is that they're doing or why they're doing it, um, but you can observe them. And um, also keep in mind that uh, there are many things that, uh, you know, that basically you're just better off doing an observation, okay? Um, things, there are things that, uh, you know, you shouldn't ask people about because it may be personal. So you might just want to uh, do an observation. Like you can observe parenting, uh, for instance, uh, or you can observe, let's say, whether parents spank their children, let's say, if it happens out in public. Um, but, um, you know, so it's not something that, uh, you know, you have to ask about, which could be a sensitive thing. We'll talk about asking, you know, basically asking questions in a moment. That would be a survey. This is one where you just observe, you leave people alone, you just observe and you record behavior. Let's keep going. There are also disadvantages to naturalistic observations. One is that the researcher may interfere with the ongoing behavior. You wanna be careful when you observe right, especially if you're, doing, if you're doing a naturalistic observation out in the real world, right? Um, usually that means that you don't want the people you're observing to know that you are actually watching them, that you're observing them and recording their behavior. Because if they find out, they're not gonna behave naturally. If the children at the playground some, somehow uh, figure out that you're watching them, they might feel a little bit weird. Or if you're watching adults, let's say you're observing adults, Let's say because you're interested in, you know, public displays of affection, let's say. You're interested in that. So you're observing uh, couples out in the real world who are walking around, let's say, on a college campus or at the mall or something like that. And you notice that some people hold hands, some people don't. Some people, you know, hug each other and kiss each other in public, and some people don't. You don't want them to know that you're 
observing them. Because if you do, you're going to change their behavior. And then you're not going to see real behavior that's happening spontaneously. That's a bad thing. That's going to decrease the validity of the study. Another disadvantage of uh, naturalistic observations is that there are some interesting behaviors that are very rare, things that you may not see, for instance. Um, like, uh, for instance, like uh, maybe you're uh, interested in, uh, you know, uh, people breaking the law, for, for instance, right? Well, you're really going to sit out there and observe and wait for somebody to break the law. It's not really rare that people break the law, but it is rare in a sense that, that it's not just going to happen at any moment while you're sitting out there waiting for it to happen. That wouldn't be a good thing for you to observe. If you want to know about people breaking the law, it's probably best that you ask them and do a survey, which we'll talk about in a moment. That's a different method. But there are some things that just don't happen that often that would be difficult to observe. That's the point. Even though the behavior may not be that rare, you know, they're not so easily observed. There's uh, another big problem with uh, naturalistic observations, and that is observer bias. The researcher may selectively attend to certain events and ignore others. We are all biased. The fact that we're male or female, black or white, or a certain religion versus another uh, makes us biased. We all see the world in our own unique way. And because of that, we may see things differently. I'll give you an example that uh, research supports. When a man and a woman are talking to each other, an observer of that might think that that man and woman are romantically involved in some way. If the observer is a male, that person is more likely to think they're romantically involved. If the observer is a female, then she is less likely to think they're romantically involved. She is not necessarily going to jump to those conclusions as much as males do. That's an example of observer bias. Some people are more likely to think they see certain things than others. That's something that come up, comes up later when we talk about the chapter on romantic attraction, how males perceive things differently than females. So as an observer, a male would have a certain bias that would be different from a, um, a bias that would be from a female. We're all biased in our own way, whether you're Republican, Democrat, black or white, male, female, young, old, um, all those things affect what we see and how we interpret them and therefore would affect our observations. And uh, this method is time consuming. Observations usually take a long time. It takes hours just to get some data. So observations will usually take weeks or even months to do. There are some simple observations that can be done in a matter of hours but most actually take a long time. They may take weeks or months. Those are all disadvantages. And I wanna point out by the way that just because there, there are disadvantages doesn't mean that, the, uh, that it's not worth it to do a naturalistic observation. No method is perfect. All methods have strengths and weaknesses. And I also wanna point out that there are ways to minimize these problems to make your observation better. If you're aware of these problems, there are ways to minimize them. Let's keep going. Another descriptive method is a case study. You should remember case studies from Psych 101, okay? Case studies uh, involve intensive examination of a single person or group. Let's just talk about a single person just to make it simple. So a case study is when you study one person in detail. So you spend a lot of time studying one person. All other methods, whether it's an experiment or whether it's an, obser whether it's an observation or a survey or whatever it is, all other methods involve studying multiple people. The case study is the only one where you can technically study one person. So you spend a lot of time with one person and you can learn about whatever you're interested in. It could also technically be a group like a cult or something like that, or even a specimen like studying somebody's brain. But usually to make it simple and so it's more applicable to psychology, let's just focus on a single person. So let's say, uh, you know, for instance, um, well, I'll save the example for when we, um, when we get to uh, the disadvantages, okay? Or actually the advantage and advantages and disadvantages, okay? But case studies involve the, you, means you spend a lot of time with one person. You can interview that person, survey that person. That's technically almost the same thing, right? Observe them, test them. So you spend a lot of time studying one person. So rather than, than studying a lot of people, a little bit, you study 
one person a lot, okay? Advantages of case studies? Well, one, a very good one, is that it's, uh, it will give you a rich source of, hypo it's a rich source of hypotheses. When you study one person, you will learn a lot from that one person and it will give you a lot of ideas, ideas that you can test that can, you can turn into hypotheses. Okay, so let's say you study someone who is, uh, for instance, um, who is um, close to 100 years of age or 100 years of age, okay? Because you are interested uh, in, in answering the question as to why certain people live such a long time. Well, by studying that one person who is 100 or close to 100, you can learn a lot, okay? When you interview that person, observe them, test them, so you might think about things like maybe diet has something to do with, uh, with longevity, maybe exercise, maybe having healthcare accessible, right? All sorts of things. They can lead to all sorts of ideas that can be tested. Another advantage of, uh, of a case study is that it, it allows you to study rare behaviors. Being old is not necessarily rare, but let's say you're interested in someone, for instance, who suffers from multiple personality disorder. Most people don't have that, don't suffer from that. But if you can find one person and you can study that person intensively, you can maybe learn a lot about multiple, multiple personality disorders, okay? Or maybe someone who, uh, for instance, has some kind of brain damage, okay? Uh, you're not gonna find a bunch of people who have brain damage out there, but maybe you can find out about one and you can study that one person. So there are certain things that are more rare that are harder to study and you might wanna do a case study because it might be hard to find a bunch of people who have that condition. It doesn't mean those people aren't out there. There's a lot of people who have suffered brain damage, but they are a very small percentage of the population. Let's keep going and talk about the disadvantages of a case study. Disadvantage of a case study is uh, observer bias. Again, just like with an observation, there's potential for observer bias with a case study. Um, because a case study makes use of several methods. You observe the individual you're studying, you survey them, you run tests, you do all sorts of things. And when you observe them, right, and you notice certain things, could be their posture, their tone of voice, whatever it is, um, your own personal bias can affect what you see, how you interpret it. And I mentioned that extensively already about how, whether you're male, female, young or old, rich or poor, you know, your ethnicity, all those things, uh, your religion, all those things affect how you see the world. And you can't completely separate yourself from that when you're doing uh, an observation, when you're do doing a, a study. But, you know, you can try to be objective and that's why people are trained to do research well. So I, like I said, there's ways to minimize this, but yes, there is the potential for observer bias. Another problem, actually uh, one of the, uh, most important uh, shortcomings and disadvantages of a uh, case study is that it's, it can be difficult to generalize findings from a single case. So you study one person and from this one person, you wanna say something about what's happening out there. It's hard to do if you study just one person. For instance, if you are studying someone who is close to hundred years of age, you're doing a case study, right? The ultimate goal is to basically say, based on what I learned from this person, this is what, you know, actually, um, this is what is happening out there with old people, okay? This is why they live such a long time, something like that. You wanna be able to generalize. But the case study is the only one where you only use one subject, one participant, let's say, right? And it could turn out that um, your uh, findings, uh, don't generalize very well because let's say you uh, you chose to find yourself one person who's close to 100 years of age um, to try to know something about you know like what people who live uh, to a ripe old age are like and let's say you chose uh, uh, my grandfather actually passed away a couple of years ago but my grandfather lived to uh, the age of 98 let's say you did this study in the past and you chose my grandfather he was the one who you chose for your study. And uh, you know, you learn things about my grandfather's diet, right? Uh, exercise, uh, whether he goes to the doctor, you know, smoking, drinking, that kind of stuff. And you would have learned from my grandfather that, you know, he was an alcoholic, 
He was a habitual smoker, smoked for basically almost his entire life, never went to the doctor, ate the worst kinds of food, and he still lived a very long time. Doing a case study based on my grandfather would have led you to the wrong conclusions. Your study would say something like, you know, basically uh, diet, exercise, going to the doctor, smoking, drinking, have no effect on whether you're going to live a long time. But that would be wrong. But you can actually end up studying someone who happens to be an exception, you know, who you can't really, whose behavior, whose outcomes, you can't really generalize uh, to others out there. Another disadvantage of case studies is that it's impossible to reconstruct, reconstruct causes from the complexity of past events. What that has to do with is basically when you're doing a case study, often you ask participants to tell you about things that happened in the past. And it can be impossible to reconstruct those events. Sometimes we think we remember things and we don't. And we reconstruct them. And, when we, and if you know anything about memory, when you reconstruct events and you talk about things from the past, you're actually making some things up as you go along. You don't remember everything. So we tend to fill in the pieces. We tend to reconstruct things. <clears throat> and then it could be, <clears throat> we could be wrong, right? Especially if we're talking about something complex. Often we may not have even understood at the time what was happening, but we try to reconstruct that and try to explain it. Uh, that's a problem, okay? It, it, sometimes impossible uh, to reconstruct what actually happened in an accurate way. Let's keep going. Another method, this one you may not have heard about from Psych 101. I covered it, but uh, it's not always covered. Uh, researchers can also um, use, what are called, use what is called the archival method, or they can examine archives. It's a descriptive method. Um, archives are basically public records of social behaviors, uh, just public records, or just records of, you know, of things that have happened. Those are archives. And they're not always public, by the way. But you know, as you live your life, you go to school, you go to the doctor, maybe you join the military, maybe you get married, you have kids. A lot of things are recorded. Okay, your grades, where you lived, you know, uh, whether you've been arrested, you know, uh, all sorts of things. There's medical information, and it's not always public. But if you can get access to it, you can use that information. You can use that data to actually do a study. And it would be a descriptive study. And that would be the archival method. You're using an archive, a record of behavior, let's say. The advantages of doing archival research is that you have easy access to large amounts of pre-recorded data. If you use records that are publicly available, you know, that anyone can access, for instance, um, then you have, uh, you know, a lot of pre-recorded data. You don't have to do a survey or an observation or anything like that. The data is already there. All you have to do is look at it and try to make sense of it and determine something from it. That's a very good thing. You don't have to actually collect the data yourself. It's already there. But there are some problems, of course, disadvantages. And there are more than what I'm pointing out here. There are others. But the, I'm pointing out some of the more important ones. The disadvantage of using uh, peer-recorded data or archives is that there are many interesting social behaviors that are never recorded. I'll give you an example, for instance, like uh, falling in love is usually not recorded. There is something related that is recorded, and that's getting married. When you get married, that is recorded. But falling in love is not. And most people actually fall in love a lot more often than they're going to get married. So if you're going to do an archive and you want to do a, a study, right, um, about something to that effect, uh, you or, your study would have to be about you know, people getting married, it wouldn't be about people falling in love or, you know, that kind of stuff, because those are two very different questions. One lends itself to archival research because that data is recorded, right? Getting married, falling in love, not recorded, okay? Uh, another example would be, for instance, uh, you know, breaking the law. While we may think that breaking the law is recorded because people can get arrested, and thrown in jail, thrown into prison, and that is recorded, right? Um, what you actually find is that breaking the law actually happens a lot more common uh, than we think it does. Most people actually break the law at some point in their lives, but very few people get arrested. So the question of who gets arrested is a very separate question than 
who breaks the law? Most people break the law, but not everyone is arrested. So you have to frame the question the right way if you want to be able to do in archival research. If you want to be able to do archival research. Some questions, right, uh, you can answer by looking at archives, and others you can't. You have to think of something that is recorded. Falling in love is not recorded, but marriage is. Breaking the law is not recorded, but arrests and serving jail time or, uh, or time in prison is recorded, and that's a different thing. They are related, but you have to ask the question the right way to use, in, to use archival research. Breaking the law is a very different thing than getting arrested. Other descriptive methods, the survey method, which I've mentioned in passing a, you know, a few times already. This method is perhaps the easiest one to understand. It's a method where, that involves asking people questions about their beliefs or about their behaviors. You could also ask them about how they feel, but you just ask people questions. You can ask them questions over the internet. They can fill out a paper and pencil survey. Um, you can ask them questions over the phone. That would be more of an interview or even in person, ask them questions in person, and you record what they say, that would be an interview as well. But there's several ways you can do a survey. There's several ways in which you can answer, ask people questions. And right away, I'll tell you about the advantages of a survey. Advantages of a survey is that it allows study of uh, difficult to observe behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. See, um, you know, some of the problems with those other methods like observations, um, or even archival research and even case studies is that uh, there may be some things that uh, are hard to get at. You know, there's some things that you just have to ask people about. Like for instance, um, like I said, uh, breaking the law is something that uh, almost everybody does or just about everybody, but doesn't always get recorded. So it's hard to do archival research on that. Okay. And it's hard to do an observation because it, you can't just sit there and just expect that people are just going to start breaking the law, you know, like suddenly and often for you to just do your study. So it's best to, when you're going to do that kind of, if you want to know about breaking the law, it's best to do a survey and ask people about that. It's difficult to observe. Okay. So it's better if you ask them or thoughts and feelings. It's, it's better to ask people about what they think about something. For instance, what they believe about capital punishment for something like that, or what they think about gay marriage, whether they think it's acceptable or not. How they feel, you know, for instance, uh, you know, around police. Those are things that you want to do with a survey because they're not, you can't always tell how people feel by looking at them. You can't always tell what people think um, by looking at them also, by observing them. And some behaviors are just hard to observe. So for some things, you just want to ask, okay? And you do a survey. And a survey allows you to basically, you know, uh, study all those different things. You can study behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. And that's the whole of psychology. With observations, usually you're limited to behaviors. Also with uh, archival research, usually it has to do with behaviors, right? P things that people have done that have been recorded. With a survey, you can also get at feelings and thoughts which are things that are you know, not so easy to study if you try one of those other methods. Disadvantages of surveys, there are many. We'll talk about some of the more important ones. Uh, a disadvantage of a survey is that some people uh, who respond may not be representative. This actually, this disadvantage can apply to any of the other methods, but especially to a survey when people are gonna tell you about something that you ask them about, okay? Um, you wanna make sure that when you do a survey, that you have a representative sample. So let's say if you want to know, for instance, you know, whether let's say uh, people are likely to uh, vote for a certain presidential candidate, or let's say another one, you want your sample to be representative. Because if you do your survey in a rural part of town, your survey will find that the Republican candidate is going to win by a landslide. No contest, right? But if you do your survey in a, uh, you know, you get your, your people for your survey from a, let's say a more uh, urban place, a big city, that survey will show something very differently. It will show that the Democratic candidate is going to win by a landslide. How can this, how can, you know, the same survey say different things? Well, the sample is powerful. It will, it, it, it is what is going to tell you uh, what you find. 
And if you don't have a representative sample, if you have a bias sample, you can get a very different answer than what's actually true out there. If you really want a representative sample, if you really want to know which candidate's going to win, the Republican or the Democrat, for instance, you need to you need a very diverse sample because the U.S. population uh, voters, potential voters, are very diverse. They don't just live in small towns; they also live in big cities. There's young, there's old, there's uh, basically uh, there's conservative, there's progressive, progressive, there's black, white, Latino, and male, female. All those things need to be taken into consideration if you want a representative sample. Okay, you need to make sure that you know if if the people you want to say something about, if the population is diverse, you also want your sample to be diverse. So that's a problem with survey. Okay, if you're not careful. Uh, you can get very misleading information. You can also get very misleading information from surveys because of the social desirability bias. When you ask people certain things, uh, especially things that have to do with uh, sensitive topics, people may just uh, say what they think is appropriate or acceptable and not necessarily what they actually believe, okay? Or, how, or what they actually feel. Like for instance, if you ask people for instance, uh, because let's say you're not very good at conducting surveys and you want to do a survey about racism, let's say, and you just ask people straight out, you know, to what extent are you racist? On a scale of one to five, one, not at all, five, very racist. What do you think people are going to say when they respond to your survey? Just about all of them are going to say that they're not racist at all, maybe a one. I doubt that there'll even be many twos, okay? Two would mean a little bit. Three would be, it means that there's some, you know, they're in the middle, that sometimes they're racist, sometimes they're not. Five would mean they're very racist. Four that means that they're definitely, you know, you get the point, okay? So people are not gonna be honest about that. Everyone, pretty much, or just about everyone is gonna say that they're not racist at all. But we know there's a bunch of racists out there. You ask people about gay marriage, people will say what they think is appropriate, what they think is acceptable. And nowadays, what is acceptable is to say that it's okay. And a lot of people may secretly believe that it's not okay, but they won't indicate that on the survey. Another example of social desirability bias uh, would be, uh, you know, when you ask people about sex, you ask males about how many sex partners they've had, and they tend to inflate the numbers. They don't all lie, but enough of them will give a number that is higher than is actually uh, the case, enough of them, so that the average that you get will actually be higher than it should be. Ask women the same question, how many sex partners that you have, have you had, and you'll find the opposite. And you'll find that they tend to underestimate the numbers so that the average you find will be lower than is actually true, than what you would, than it is actually, you know, when actually relates to the truth. That doesn't mean that they're all lying, but if enough of them, enough of them will give a lower number, then is actually the case so that the average will be lower than it should be. All because of social desirability bias. You have to be careful with sensitive questions. Things about race and prejudice, about sex, um, about gay marriage, anything that people might just wanna lie about or present themselves in a way that just makes them look good. Even though surveys are supposed to be anonymous, they're still affected by social desirability. Sometimes, by the way, people will just outright lie on surveys for many reasons, this being one of them. So that's a very important disadvantage of a survey. Let's keep going. Let's talk now about psychological tests. Psychological tests, usually this is not covered as a descriptive method. It wasn't in my Psych 101 class, but you can also give people a psychological test. A psychological test involves an attempt to assess an individual's ability, such as like maybe their IQ, for instance, or maybe their memory or their cognitions, you know, how they think, right? If they're paranoid, for instance, or their motivations, you know, whether they want certain things or want to do certain things, right? Or even their behaviors. Psychological tests are different um, than surveys. Uh, it is similar in some ways because both of them, you have participants sort of self-report, okay? Where they report something. But a survey usually asks questions uh, that it's clear what, uh, you, know, you know, what it's about, you know? You ask people, you know, for instance, like, uh, you know, um, you know, do you drink alcohol? Do you consume marijuana? Those kind of things. A psychological test, the questions aren't necessarily direct, okay? You might be asked a question about uh, how you see certain things or what certain things make you think of, or maybe the, test, maybe the test is trying to get at whether you're paranoid or not. It's not usually just gonna come out and ask you, are you paranoid? That would be more of a survey, 
okay? Or your ability, it's gonna give you problems to solve. And, and how well you solve them will determine, let's say your IQ, or it will test your memory. How well you remember things will determine your memory. So psychological tests aren't obvious, necessarily obvious as to what they're getting at. That's the difference. You're actually being tested here. You're not just reporting whether you're smart or whether you believe something. Instead, you get to answer questions or solve problems that indicate that you're smart, indicate that you have good memory or indicate that you're paranoid instead of just reporting that. So it's, a diff it's different, that's, that's a psychological test. The advantages of a psychological test is that it allows measurement of characteristics that are not always easily observable, right? Intelligence, can we easily observe that? We might be able to tell a little bit about whether if somebody is smart or not, but not, you know, not so accurately. You know, somebody can act like a total dumbass and that person might still be smart. I remember people in high school who were getting Fs, bunch of Fs in just about all their classes. And then they took the SAT and they got a really high score. What does that say, right? That basically how smart you are, if you believe the SAT actually relates to that or how well you can solve problems uh, isn't always so easily observable from what you see. So, but if you give them a test, you can see that, you know, like those people who scored very high in the SAT, it usually suggests that they're very smart, but they're not very responsible or motivated when it comes to class. So you can't always see how smart people are, how capable they are, right? You can't see what people are thinking, their cognitions. You can't always tell if they want something or not, their motivations just by looking at them. So things that are not easily observable, you can just test. You can test their memory. You can test their intelligence. You can tell, you know, you can give them a psychological test of paranoia. That would be, you know, a certain kind of thought. So that's the advantage of psychological tests. They usually get at things that are not easily observed. So you have to test for them. So they measure things that are uh, more psychological, usually more things that are, well, not psychological, but things that are considered constructs. Okay, rather than things that are, you know, concrete, but I'm getting a bit too um, philosophical here. That's for a higher level class, that distinction there. But yes, you can uh, measure things that are not so easily observable. Disadvantages of psychological tests. Um, one is that the test may be unreliable. Okay, uh, which means that the test can give you inconsistent scores. A test that is unreliable is not a good test. You shouldn't use that test at all. An unreliable test uh, is just one that gives you very different answers at different times. Let's say you took an IQ test. And the first time you took it, it said you have an IQ of 100, that you're average. And the, same time, and the second time you took the test, let's say weeks later, it says you have an IQ of like 130, that you're gifted or something like that. That's a very unreliable test. The scores are inconsistent. That test isn't measuring anything if it can't even give you an a consistent score. So the test can be unreliable, okay? Which means that it's not really measuring anything. Now, tests that are been, now here's the thing, a lot of tests that you've heard about out there, the SAT test or GRE or LSAT or IQ test or whatever test like that are usually very reliable, okay? They've been tested, they've been validated. Well, validation is another thing, but they've been tested, they, you know, and to make sure that they are reliable. They are extremely reliable. Okay, but just because a test is reliable doesn't mean it's valid. A test can be reliable and give you nearly the same score every time, but it may not be valid. The test may not measure what it's actually designed to measure. And the perfect example of that is an IQ test. IQ tests are extremely reliable. You know, they give you nearly the same score every time. So would an SAT test or a GRE test, but let's just stick to IQ tests for a moment. So an IQ test is measuring something. It gives you nearly the same score every time, but is it valid? A lot of people argue that the test is not valid, that it's not really measuring intelligence like the test makers claim. They claim that the test is just measuring knowledge. And those that have been exposed to more knowledge, those who have gotten a better education, those who are more privileged are gonna do better on those tests than those that have had a poor education or are not privileged. Some people just basically say that these IQ tests are nothing but a measure of privilege or a measure of knowledge that is considered appropriate by those that are privileged and who determine what is acceptable knowledge. So a lot of people question the validity of tests. 
whether they're actually measuring intelligence, the validity of uh, IQ tests, whether it's actually measuring intelligence. But the tests are very highly, are highly reliable. They do give you nearly the same core, score every time. So disadvantage, the test may be unreliable or the test may, be, may not be valid. Those are things that you have to think about you know, when you give a test. Um, when you do use these descriptive methods, you know, let's say you're doing a survey, an observation, uh, you're doing archival research, any of these methods, um, uh, you, can, um, you can use correlations uh, to determine um, if there's associations among the things that you're studying. So descriptive methods are useful in determining correlation. You ask people, for instance, about their age, you ask them about their GPA, let's say in a survey, you ask people about whether, you know, they have health care. You can ask them about how high their income is or how low it is, right? You ask them about their income. And you can determine if there are associations uh, or correlations between those things. Is there, for instance, a uh, correlation between income, let's say, and, um, and GPA? OK. Uh, Another way of asking that uh, is it is it that uh, people who are wealthier have higher GPAs? Is that the case? And people who are less wealthy will have lower GPAs. Is there a correlation there? And I can tell you based on research that I've read and research that has been conducted by my own students that there is a correlation, okay? But we'll talk about a moment what that actually means, okay? It's an association, but what does that really mean, okay? So we can determine correlations. And remember from Psych 101, you should have heard a little bit about this, or maybe a lot, is that a correlation is basically uh, the extent to which two or more things are associated with one another, the extent to which two or more things are related. So is there a relationship between income and GPA? Is there a relationship between, let's say, income and IQ? Research does shows that those who have higher incomes tend to score higher on IQ tests. We'll talk about what that really says in a moment because we have to think carefully about what correlations actually say, okay? But I'm almost getting ahead of myself. I need to save that for the you know, next couple of slides. Um, in order to determine a correlation, you need to know about the correlation coefficient. And that's a math mathematical expression that is called R, right? Um, that is basically a number between negative one to positive one, of course, with zero in the middle. So R is the basically mathematical expression of this correlation. If the correlation is positive one or negative one, that's basically a perfect correlation. It's as strong as it could be. If the correlation is close to zero, that means that there is no association there. There's not much correlation. Okay, that's what the correlation coefficient tells us. Now, we also have to remember, hopefully you, you know, learned a little bit about this from Psych 101, that uh, you know, correlations, you can have positive correlations and you can also have negative correlations. You can also have no correlation, which means that R is close to zero, okay? But we need to talk about positive and negative correlations and what that means. No correlation means that there's no relationship. What is a positive correlation? A positive correlation means that the variables move in the same direction. One increases as the other one increases or one decreases as the other one decreases. A positive correlation means that if one thing is high, the other one is also high. If one thing is low, the other one is also low. And here's an example for you guys. People who eat more broccoli tend to live longer. According to a study that was done, right, um, it found that association, that correlation. Uh, that might confuse some of you guys. You say, what the heck does broccoli have to do with living longer? You have to keep in mind it's a correlation. It's an association. Maybe people who eat broccoli also have uh, you know, a healthy diet, which is useful for living longer. Maybe they follow other healthy things. Maybe they exercise, maybe they go to the doctor, take better care of themselves. It's a, an association, it's a relationship, okay? But yes, studies have shown that. Another positive correlation that I've already mentioned is basically people with higher incomes also tend to have higher GPAs. People from higher incomes tend to have, uh, from higher income households tend to have higher GPAs in high school, higher GPAs in college. What does that mean? It means those two things are related, okay? But I'm gonna say, you know, what it doesn't mean for, for the next slide. 
Let's move on to a negative correlation. A negative correlation means that variables move in the opposite direction. One increases, the other one decreases. Okay, or vice versa. If one is high, the other one is low. If one is low, the other one is high. So they're kind of at opposite ends. An example, it's harder to think of negative correlations, but an example would be lower temperatures are associated with more common cold cases. When the temperature is lower, more people get colds, more people get the cold. Okay. When the temperature is higher, less people get the cold. You're less likely to get a cold in the summer. That's a negative correlation. Or another example of a negative correlation would be, you know, for instance, like um, the higher your stress, the uh, less happy you are. That's another example of a negative correlation. But correlations only tell us, the, to tell us that, let's say two things are associated, that they're related in some way. It doesn't tell us that the two things cause each other, okay? And that's the point I've been kind of, you know, um, almost hinting at, but I try not to say it, okay? The question is, when we look at correlations, can we determine a causal relationship between correlated variables? So because two things are correlated, does that mean they cause each other? So let's say, uh, you know, like I said before, broccoli is positively correlated with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, living to a ripe old age. Does that mean that eating broccoli causes you to live longer? Not necessarily. Like I said, it could mean that there's other things that are related to eating broccoli that actually are what's having the effect. In order to determine whether broccoli does cause people to live longer, you have to do an experiment. Experiments are the only things that get a cause and effect. Another relationship that was mentioned, another correlation, was that when temperatures are lower, more people get the common cold. Does that mean that cold temperature causes the common cold? No, it does not. Just because two things are related doesn't mean that one causes the other. In order to determine cause and effect, you have to do an experiment. And if you do an experiment, you would find out that the temperature doesn't cause the common cold. And as you guys already know, it's a virus that causes the common cold. The virus just happens to spread more easily, reproduce more rapidly, or spread itself more rapidly when it's cold. So we can't determine a cause and effect relationship from a correlation, okay? In order to determine causality, in order to determine cause and effect, we need to look to experimental methods. But that is something that will be um, in the next lecture. So I'll stop here.